Hi, welcome to the first lecture of our Acting One course. Now I'm going to be focusing on acting with physical expression. Theater is a unique art form. It takes everyone working together to make a show happen. As an actor, you need to know and appreciate all of the work that has happened all around you that can give you a chance to have the best performance possible. By taking this course, I hope the continuing training you will seek, that you will find that you're becoming a part of a community, a community of professionals and future professionals like you, working toward a common goal to become the best we can be as performers and humans and to realize each of us is unique in our own talents and that by sharing these talents we can create great art. Shine bright and enjoy the journey. We will be exploring a variety of techniques and I encourage you to trust yourself to know which tools are best for you. I will share the ones that I use and the ones that I think are most useful to a modern actor. Um, but you may find that some of the things I do are things that you already do, but maybe in a different way. And that's all right. As artists, we all have a calling and a pull to create. The expression of that creation needs to work in sync with the entire community, but your natural talents and your approach to expression will always be unique. Let me caution you to stay ready, to improve, to grow. You never know when an experience that you have might be just the right thing to lift you to the next level. Never get complacent. Always aim for better. I see many young actors full of life and natural talent who believe that the applause and the successes that they have had in high school or on the community theater stage has already prepared them for joining the professional community. Why take an acting one class? I have experience. Acting one seems so basic. You really need to think of this as a way to grow. What, wherever you're starting, however much talent you already have, however much experience you may already have. You need to see that trait in yourself and to ask you to compare yourself to professionals who are in other performing arts. Dancers never stop taking class. They always warm up. Singers never stop taking private voice lessons, learning new music. They always warm up as an actor you should expect no less from yourself. Even the disappointments, the times you aren't cast, or the occasional bad review, or the mistake, ugh, the horrible mistake in rehearsal, or on stage, they can all teach you how to improve. It's all valuable. Training is essential to a long career. Warming up before going on stage is crucial to being able to represent the character in depth from the moment you set foot on stage. So yes, there are people who do have a natural ability at acting. There are people who've been lucky and have had opportunities for them in their community before they even got here. Don't you want to do even better than that? Don't you even want to grow higher, learn how to refine those skills even more. That's what this course is for. It's not just a basic learn the bottom line acting. This is how do you improve yourself as an actor. And the way to do that is to keep training. So I'm glad you've started. Now, when I go to the theater, if I can see the acting, <laughs> I already don't like it. In other words, if the performer underneath the character can be seen and their mind and their speculations and what they adjust and arrange is visible to me, I think, honestly, that that's bad acting. <sighs> they just are not in character yet. You don't want to watch the person. You want to see the character. An actor who has taken the time to warm up and prepare the character knows where they're coming from before they even set foot on the stage. Where has that character just been? What has motivated them to get on stage? They know where they're going. 
as the character. They always have a destination. They always have a place that they're going to. And then when they, they leave, if they've stayed from the moment they've entered through the scene to the moment they've exited, I, it really has helped me as an audience member sustain my suspension of disbelief so that I can accept them in the role. I don't see like a split personality of something com coming in and out of focus. Um, we, as the audience, want to see the character. There are many actors who believe they can be, be playful off stage, and suddenly upon entering from the moment their foot sets foot on stage, they can just assume the character. Well, let me tell you a secret. <laughs> we can see you warm up. The audience just watches until you as a person morphs more into the character that you're actually trying to portray. You think you can get away with it, but we can see that. When an actor has prepared and done the homework and made the preparations, when I believe that there's a human being in action up there, in that moment, in real life, alive, right there, I get spellbound. <laughs> now, it can be true that sometimes people get tied to what they want and they start thinking in movements and gestures and they lose their grounding. If you try to show everything that occurs to you as you prepare the character, you can become unclear as you try to communicate, uh, oh, oh ooh, you know, too much. <laughs> instead of refining one clear message in your expression of that role. In that situation, when you can't think, when you can't focus and you can't have a destination and a clear message for the role, you know what's wrong? You're not functioning. It's true for many of us. You were born an actor or you wouldn't even be in the course. And you should be on stage all the time. But you're not keeping your thoughts clear. That's something I can help you with. Here's one example. Suppose your character is waiting for someone else on the scene. You've been left alone on set and you're, someone has exited. Someone else is coming in. You're waiting for somebody to enter. Or you're waiting anxiously for something to happen. Uh, Often a director will say, pace, you know, walk back and forth. The problem with that is you're aimless. That's not enough for you as a person to know what to do with. So you need a destination. You need to be actively be in the character's shoes. Pacing is not a destination. It's an activity. And the director has given you an activity and some of the other actions on stage that are given to you, specific timing of entrances and exits, where you cross, where you sit and walk, are often given to you by the director. But it should be up to you to make those movements make sense. The director can only give you the scaffolding, but you have to flesh it out. You might have been given a brilliant piece of stage business, but if you can't figure out how to use it, these pieces of business will fail. And chances are the director will go, hmm, uh, it's not working, let's try something else. They'll give you something a little less interesting or something that requires a little less skill to do. So let me go back to pacing. Hmm. If you were asked to pace, um, you want to give yourself still a destination. So I'm, I'm, I'm pacing. As I go this way, I might be thinking, oh, oh, my, my plant needs watering, but where is that watering can that might lead me over to this direction? Um, your thoughts interrupt you. Uh, where could the watering can be? I forgot. Uh, oh, look, there's dust on the table over there. I better, I better clean up the dust before the next person comes in. Uh, but I was looking for a watering can and that was over here. Those thoughts will lead you to be able to do that movement, that back and forth movement. You're thinking them, you're not saying them, but 
those thoughts will help you look motivated as opposed to just without a destination. So that would be one of our first things to play with is what do you do in those moments when you're waiting? The action will be that you're pacing perhaps, but the appearance of that would be that the pacing is a natural outcome of your anxious thinking as you wait. Let me give you a few examples. If I'm doing a scene and I need to hang up pants, and that's, that's the movement. Okay, this is the action that the director has given me, is that I'm gonna hang up these, these pants. <sighs> but when it only becomes about hanging up the pants, and that becomes more important than the character, or what the character's saying, you've already lost it. You've lost your focus on a thing. you've stopped actually being in the moment and you're starting to just indicate or gesture. If you stay in the moment, you could have a whole five minute scene with hanging up the pants and using the subtext and the emotion underneath it, uh, using that stage direction or stage business. Now that's what the director gave you. That's the action you're supposed to do as you do this scene. But as you go to hang up these pants, you might get interrupted by the conversation uh, that you have, and you may never actually hang up the pants if you're really listening to the other actor on stage and playing a scene with them. <laughs> it's a fun story just to illustrate that. Working in Summerstock, we were in a theater, and the back of the theater was right next to a firehouse in that town. Um, and we're doing a show, most one actor's on stage, he's waiting for the scene to start, and the alarm went off in the firehouse. Very, very loud. Uh, there was just, there's no way to ignore that that was what was going on. But the actor uh, heard it and was like, huh, okay. And he went over and he checked his chair. And he found that the chair was... Uh, a little a little off balance it wasn't wasn't quite comfortable enough and the alarm went off and the actor took a breath to start and the alarm went off again and he got up and he found a book and now uh, he every every time he found a new book to put underneath the chair to make sure it wasn't wobbly every once in a while oh hmm, that's interesting <laughs> And put that under the chair to make sure it was steady. The fire alarm stopped. He took a breath and the fire alarm went off again. He went on. This guy covered and stayed in character the entire time that the fire alarm went on and off and on and off. It must have been, oh, two, three minutes. Anyway, he ended up making himself a peanut butter sandwich and eating half of it. Well, by the time the fire alarm stopped and he really could continue with the scene, he took a breath and could actually speak, he got a standing ovation. Part of it was because he acknowledged the, the situation he was in without breaking character. And then he gave the audience something to watch. He didn't just say, all right, well, we'll just wait for this to finish. And then have everybody in the audience hold up their expectation of the show. He said, come with me on a journey. I'm still going to stay in character. I'm still going to you know, stay in this story. And I'm still going to give you more information about who I am. Um, as you build a character, it does help to know the set. That, that was very useful for him to know which books were actual practical books and which books were painted books. Know the set. Know what you can use. Make this place your own, as if you really live there. Do all of the activities that the director asks you to do before or at the same time as you learn the lines and do them over and over and over again so you never really have to think about what's next. You can stay in the moment because what's next is already in your mind. 
big thing is you got to learn the lines. Oof. An actor's biggest bane. I will give you a whole lesson on how to memorize later on, but do know that memorizing the lines is your job. It's nobody else's job. There will never be enough time just in rehearsal with everyone watching you for you to run your lines and learn them just in the time you give to rehearsals. I think that was a big surprise to a lot of my college students is they assumed as they would with the class. They come to rehearsal, they walk through the role, they memorize their lines, they write their notes, and and yet the lines didn't just come to them. No, you actually have to do homework. You have to take it home. You have to run the lines. Uh, sometimes it does help to wait until you get your blocking so that you can tie the line to the movement. I know that helps me. Um, sometimes it helps to know the message of the overall scene. Sometimes it helps to write things on index cards or run them, just run them and run them and run them with a friend. Um, sometimes it helps to record them in some way and have them played back to you, either to watch or to hear uh, on video or on audio and have them just playing constantly until you can say it right along with yourself. <laughs> but there's really never been a magic secret revealed to making memorization easier. It's just simply repetition. And when you're not called upon to be on stage, you probably should be running your lines, um, working with another actor. Uh, there are a lot of techniques to that, and I've outlined a few of them here, but I will give you a whole class on just how do I memorize all of these lines? It can also be very hard to stay in character when you're searching for that next word. And the sooner you can be confident in your lines, the deeper you can go into your character and the less time you waste in rehearsal. Oh, which leads me to wasting time. Wasting time in rehearsal is really not good. Uh, in professional theater, time is money. They've rented the space. They need to make the most of this time. In community or college or high school theater, uh, nonprofit showcase theater, the space may not literally be costing money, but everyone there is sacrificing their time to be there. And the problem when you are not prepared and you've wasted time and you've arrived late and you don't know your lines is it's not just your time lost. It's your scene partner. Anyone there watching rehearsal, the director, the stage manager, the ASM, the tech crew, all of them are now watching you flounder. To be on time in theater really means to be early. You don't show up right on time. You show up a little bit early so that you can prepare yourself. You can run your lines, you can stretch, you can talk to another actor to form bonds. When you're late, you basically communicate to the entire cast that you don't really care about them. You just pretty much have said your own time is more important than all of the people and all of their problems and all of the sacrifices they've made to be there that you are more important than all of those people. You know, it doesn't happen in American culture, but this is a little something interesting off the point. Uh, Japanese culture. In Japanese culture, a late person actually needs to pay back the time that they've taken from all the other people working. So I guess that, that, that monetary loss is a motivation. But for me, it's the respect that I lose um, from the rest of the cast. I would want them to respect me, to see me as a professional. And even worse, I want them, I don't want to lose their trust. You start to lose their trust since they feel that they can't depend on you to hold up your end uh, of the scene and they're worried they're frightened that they might be on stage with someone who they're gonna have to cover for true intentions 
when you really mean what you're saying, can easily be seen and understood by the audience. They can see when you're no longer in character. They can see when something unexpected has happened in how you handle it. And that is what keeps the audience tied to you. Something small where you don't honor the audience and you don't honor your character or you haven't prepared enough to stay in character, something small, a break in the reality you're creating on stage can make the whole audience look at that mistake, stop watching the story being told and get stuck in your, in your tiny little moment of, of a mistake. Um, <laughs> There's a story about, uh, uh, well, an actor I was working with who drank a little bit too much. They'll always tell you, oh, actors, actors, are, oh, they drink and they, they, they sleep around. They do all kinds of things because they need to experience things in order to know how to play a character. Um, not really with the people I have ever worked with. I know that that can happen out there. Um, and I've certainly worked with people like that. But uh, some of those moments can be funny in retrospect. In the moment, they're kind of horrifying, though. We had a lead singer come down a flight of stairs in uh, an operetta, and she was supposed to sing, See if you can answer, who's the better dancer? And instead, she came down the stairs and said, See if you can answer, who's the one with cancer? And there was just no real way the entire chorus pretty much turned up stage to hide their shock, their laughter, their trying to figure out how to cover for this, this person who was not prepared, who actually was drunk on stage and messed up a line which could have derailed the entire show if there weren't people ready to cover. You don't want to be on stage with somebody else like that. You don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that everybody can can trust and depend and work with. Not only that, but it, you look foolish. <laughs> I don't ever want to send an actor on stage looking foolish. I would rather have to remove them, as painful as that is, to have to say, I'm sorry, you can't be in the show, than I would to have them go on stage and have 400 audience members see what I see in rehearsal, which is not the craft or the art of acting. They're, they're doing something else. Um, they're just trying to get attention, perhaps. So when you've got all of that going on, the people are able to be trusted. Some people are not being, some people are not trusted. Some people are, uh, are sober. You, you need to stay in character. Bottom line, that's what that example is about. Even if you're all alone and have nothing happening, when a stage direction calls for you to wait, when you're on stage with somebody who is not as prepared as you and who is constantly, you're constantly worried about what's going to come out of their mouth. Are they going to give you the cue? Are they going to jump and mess up the scene? And you're constantly re ready to have to cover. You can't be in character. You can't fully absorb the character and fully be in it and really make it an artistic experience. It becomes kind of a gymnastic at that point. So let's talk a little bit about pacing and being alone on stage before you get into the whole morass of everybody else. So if you're all alone and nothing has happened, when a stage direction calls for you to wait, what do you do? In order to be authentic, do you just sit and stare? Sometimes, if that's what that character would do, you need to know what you're waiting for. You need to always have a destination, something that you're reaching for. So what are you doing while you're waiting? You need to know what it is you're waiting for. A person, a subway train, a bus. Why are you there waiting? So what will you do? You adjust your glasses? Do you, do you fix your, your clothes? 
to look around for something to do. Maybe, maybe if you play with your phone. Most of us don't just stand still, rigidly still, and wait. Most of us try to fill the time. Maybe you count the cracks. In a crisis, you may be confused. And what do you do in your state of confusion in your mind? Your physical life needs to be motivated by reality. You need to follow the action and the direction that the, that the director gives you, but it needs to be motivated by something that you come up with. That's part of the actor's craft. Um, funny thing, we never stand if we can sit. So if you do get up and you get up for a reason, maybe I'm gonna get you a drink, you interrupt me with the dialogue, I may have, end up standing here for 10 minutes and never actually give you the drink. But I had a destination. I had a plan for where I was going. Your, your body is always going to fight to be relaxed. Um, that lets us see the tension and the conflict. It makes you interesting to watch, even if you have no lines. So you ground yourself. And what I mean by that is to ask yourself, what did I just do? What am I doing now? And what do I want? The answers to those three questions will get you moving. If the body isn't with you in the scene, all the talking and thinking and analyzing that you do will really not be able to be clear to the audience. You have to have it grounded in your body. We're often told how to, how not to watch ourselves and our bodies. Um, people are easier with talking about feelings, we can analyze, we can talk a blue streak about what they or their character should be feeling, but the behavior needs to be the tool you use to show those feelings, to make that subtext, that emotional foundation of what your character is doing. It needs to have a physical foundation to be real. You need to watch yourself. What is your physical destination? When you are spaceless, your body will tense, You'll come off self-conscious. You'll come off tense. But if you know where you're going, you know where you came from, and what you're doing in the scene is very clear to you, then your body can relax and all of that great background and psychological work you did on the scene can come out. Otherwise, we're just trying to do too much all at the same time and you end up simply being unclear. Allow yourself to naturally feel how you feel, you, underneath the character, how you feel in that moment. See if that can inform the scene or give you depth in character or add the emotions or subtext beneath the scene. <laughs> Talk to yourself. It's involuntary. We all do it. Most of the time, we don't know it. I don't talk to myself when I'm physically still. Usually, you need an activity. It doesn't have to be finished. But we talk to ourselves to be able to get control of the, the circumstances. Recently, we've all been in quarantine and had to be alone. So you might be aware of how often it is that you kind of talk to yourself, you sing to yourself. Um, in a monologue, for instance, you need the words to help you find answers. So you do need the text. You've got a script right there. But there's more than the written word that's in that paper. What are the sounds? The, oh, oh the, oh, ah, the, the gasps, the, what are the songs that you sing as you wait or as you support the text that's on the page as you're thinking? You need them to place into the text as it moves off of the page and into your body. Now, some people think you don't talk to yourself unless you're crazy, but we do all do it. Use that inner monologue as a subtext, the emotional foundation for the written word and help you know, let them help you with the text that you're meant to memorize. Anyway, these are just some of the things that I hope to help you work through in this acting class. Your first assignment is to videotape yourself waiting what do you do? Where are you coming from? Are you late? Are you having an easy day, a good day? Where are you going? All of that comes into your waiting. 
No one simply just stands and wait. You move, you talk to yourself or sing or sign sometimes. You check, check your watch, you check the time, you check your phone. Most of the time you don't find anything. You look for the person who's making you wait or the train or the cab or the bus. Uh, you take then the time to videotape yourself waiting. This is your assignment. You video yourself waiting. Not a character, you. How do you wait for one whole minute, 60 seconds? You need to time yourself. And I know a minute can feel like a long time when you're on stage, but notice what it is you do. What do you do as you wait for that video timer to run out? <laughs> And for you to be able to give me a minute's worth of letting me see you, uh, I need to start by knowing who are you uh, and give me some, some clues just by your body language and how it is that you pass time when you have to wait. So I'm very glad you came. I can't wait to talk to you again. And... I'm looking forward to seeing your video. Do check in on my courses, check the quizzes and the discussions so that we can stay in better communication. And if anything I have said is unclear, please do email me at lrdnpa at rit.edu. I'm very excited to begin this journey with you.